Good evening to everybody. I'm Elena Magnani, a postdoc in NYU Abu Dhabi in the biology program in the, in the lab of uh, Dr. Kirsten Sadler Redepli. And it's a great, great pleasure for me tonight to have the opportunity to introduce her. So uh, Dr. Sadler obtained her bachelor degree in, uh, uh, sorry, in biology and anthropology in the Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. And then she moved to Harvard Medical School to have her master science degree in uh, uh, medical scientist and for her uh, PhD in cell and developmental biology. After the PhD, she joined the faculty of uh, Bosphorus University in Turkey. And then she went back to the US to work with Nancy Hopkins and MIT. And both Nancy Hopkins and her PhD supervisor are member of the National Academy of Science. She started in her lab in 2006 in uh, the Department of Medicine and Developmental and Regenerative Biology at the Mount Sinai in New York. And in 2015, she joined the NYU Abu Dhabi as a tenured associate professor in the biology program. <laughs> Dr. Sader, she has a very successful and productive lab, and she authored seminal discoveries in finding molecular mechanisms underlying fatty liver diseases and liver cancer development. And she's the author of more than 30 publications in very important journals, such as Cancer Cell Development, Hepatology, which is also part of the associate editor. And then she's also a member of the executive board in Zebrafish Disease Model uh, Society. Beside her successful career as a scientist, she worked to promote the activity and the equality of women in science. And in fact, she's part, she's the fund member of Women in Cell Biology, and here at NYU Abu Dhabi, she's the faculty advisor of a student group of women empo empowered in STEM. Beside her exceptional brilliance, she's uh, an inspiring mentor who lead from the front of her hard work and positive attitude. So this evening, she will present a work research um, a talk entitled Research Using Little Fish for Solving Health Big Problem. And so please help me to welcome her tonight. Uh, so. Hi, good evening, and thank you. Um, Elena, thank you so much for um, introducing me. And um, I'd like to tell you that I'm going to talk about two things tonight. My title is a little bit misleading because I am going to talk about big health problems and how we try to address those using that little fish you saw on the first slide. But I'm also going to talk to you about my perspective of how creativity and curiosity and collaboration work together um, with uh, a diverse team of scientists to accelerate discovery and promote great science. So. Um, I want to start by saying that um, all of the work that we do as scientists is never in isolation. And um, I love this quote. I'm going to be sharing lots of quotes with you tonight. This is one of, um, uh, uh, one of my favorites from Isaac Newton, um, where he says, if I have seen further than others, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. And I um, came into science under great mentorship from Joan Ruderman and Nancy Hopkins. And then I continue my, um, in my independent career with really amazing people that um, have worked either as collaborators with me or in my lab. And um, when I <coughs> think about how we make discoveries and how we approach big problems, it's really not me who's coming up with the ideas. It's all these amazing people who have worked with me and worked together to come up with great solutions. So um, I was very fortunate to have an incredibly supportive and productive lab in New York. Um, and then several of the people joined me here in Abu Dhabi. So I have a really dynamic team and uh, many of them are in the audience. So really when I talk to you about our work, it's just that I'm being a spokesperson because the work is all theirs. Okay, so now let's start with some bad news. So we all know that cancer and obesity are really deadly. So we see it in the news, cancer's a, um, a big killer, catching up with heart disease. Um, <clears throat> we know that diabetes is um, 
is killing many people worldwide. The obesity strategy, some say, is failing. We brought attention to cancer by celebrities who have faced cancer on their own. And some of these public ideas or public um, demonstrations of um, of these diseases have led to some progress in developing strategies to address them, such as the cancer moonshot that was just launched um, under the last uh, American administration to tackle the problem of cancer. Um, but the problem is not just focused in America, and it's not just focused on celebrities. This is really um, both uh, obesity and cancer are worldwide problems, and shown here on these density maps for the uh, overweight and uh, <clears throat> incidents across the world, you can see that there are some countries that are dark red, and those are the countries where the percent of overweight um, men or here in women um, are over 60%. And uh, unfortunately, my home country of America and now my adopted region here in the Middle East top the list on a percent of uh, overweight and obese people. When you think about diabetes, the picture doesn't get much better. The incidence of diabetes is um, currently staggering. Um, it's over uh, 35 million in the Americas, and it's projected to raise to over 65 million by um, 2030 just in the Americas. In the Middle East, the numbers are equally as bad. And now let's turn to cancer. So cancer also, although the global incidence of cancer has been decreasing, you can still see that there are regional hotspots where there's a very high incidence of cancer in men and in women. And um, for those of you who like to look on the bright side, these light pink um, countries are generally countries where the average light, um, age is very low. So as those countries, as that population ages, we expect to see the incidence rise in those. Okay, so it's not only cancer and obesity and diabetes that you have to worry about, but um, the liver also is a major um, uh, source of, of concern. This was an article from the Time Health section just from uh, earlier this week where um, they point out that 30 to 40% of Americans have a disease called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this sounds pretty bad. Um, it's actually not as bad as it sounds, but this is one of the, um, the, the predecessors for developing more serious liver disease. So liver disease is really, um, is really a, a definitely a bad one when you look at the global causes of mortality. So this is um, a little bit outdated, but the numbers haven't changed much since 2010. So if you look at all the reasons why people die across the world, <clears throat> um, the Liver disease, characterized by cirrhosis or liver cancer, is the only, that's the only organ that really makes this list in the top 22 times. So um, the issue uh, that we <coughs> are facing is that we have some major health problems and we don't know right now how to solve them. So let's get on with some good news, and that's about this amazing organ that we um, that we study, and it's the liver. So um, your amazing liver right now is doing so many um, jobs for you. Um, I hope you're all grateful that it is carrying out detoxification of foreign compounds and metabolizing those foreign compounds. It's modulating your immune system. It's metabolizing fats. It's metabolizing sugar. It's responding to insulin. It's helping with your digestion by secreting bile and also secreting proteins into your blood. And additionally, this liver has this incredible capacity to regenerate. So um, we've known about how amazing the liver is for uh, a long time. Um, the ancient Egyptians used to force feed geese to produce foie gras, um, which is fatty liver. And, um, and the ancient Greeks knew that the liver could regenerate in that they tell the the myth of Prometheus who stole fire from the gods, this is Zeus with his fire, Prometheus stole it and his punishment was to be chained to a rock and have his liver eaten by an eagle every night. It would grow back again and then the eagle would return. So we've known for a long time that the liver is, um, is an amazing organ. Um, 
But we now face a challenge, and that is that we have an overwhelming burden of liver disease, and we really have very limited treatments, preventions, or cures for fatty liver and liver cancer. So I'm a basic scientist, and my approach to this is to understand how these diseases form. <clears throat> okay, so some of the questions that my lab is focused on is to really understand the cellular and genetic basis of these pathologies. So we ask questions like, in fatty liver, how does the fat get there? <clears throat> Once it's there, how do the ha what happens in the liver? How do the hepatocytes and the whole organism respond to this abnormal lipid accumulation? And in liver cancer, a very simple and broad question in the field of cancer is how does cancer form? And we know that there are many mechanisms in our cells to stop cancer cells from spreading or dividing, but these obviously fail because we develop, so because there's many cases of cancer. So how do cancer cells evade these mechanisms to suppress the tumors? So we approach these systems by um, these questions by using a model organism. So why is a model organism great for studying cancer or for studying really any processes in biology? It's because human experiment, uh, experimentation is not ethical. So we've, um, we learned this through um, examples such as the Tuskegee um, study of untreated syphilis in men in America, where um, men who had syphilis were left untreated for about 40 years so that doctors could study the natural course of syphilis of infection. This led to a very, ro um, when this was discovered, this led to a very robust um, um, development of review boards to prevent such experimentation in the future. But also when we study, when we want to do a study, and as scientists, we like to manipulate something and see what happens afterwards, that's not um, possible to do with humans. And additionally, we can control the environment and have a homogeneous population when we use model organisms. <coughs> we also, um, we, we know any of you who have, who have had pets know that animals, just like people, can get diseases like cancer or fatty liver or diabetes. And we believe in evolution. So evolution tells us that the same genes and pathways are used over and over and over. So studying something in um, a fish is um, what we learn from studying a fish will apply to all the other organisms on that evolutionary tree. So there are a lot of model organisms that people have used for um, centuries, and um, they are invertebrates, such as worms, the vertebrates, mo most common um, uh, is the mouse. We use this zebrafish, this little zebrafish, that, this little fish that's, um, that is a vertebrate, and there are some distinct advantages to using this system. So one is that the embryos develop outside the mother and develop very quickly. They're the embryos are transparent, so you can see what's going on during development just by looking at them under a simple microscope. Um, there's genetic conservation. We have lots of genetic tools so we can manipulate the genes. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, the mechanisms of disease are largely um, the same as what we see in humans. So um, we also can keep lots of fish in a small space. This is a, um, what we call racks of um, tanks that are sitting over in um, the basement of the ERB, where we have uh, about 2,000 fish right now. Um, we get them to get their embryos by putting a male and a female in a tank overnight. When the lights come on in the morning, they spawn, and those embryos um, come to the bottom of the tank. We can set up many, many of these mating tanks every day. And in the morning, we can simply decant off the embryos into a Petri dish and <clears throat> then look under the microscope and see hundreds of these little embryos developing synchronously before our eyes. So the, um, I'll show you what we see every day, and <clears throat> but on an um, accelerated time course. So what I'm going to show you is this movie of the first 18 hours of zebrafish development. So this is the yolk. This is how they get all their nutrients during development. And these are the two cells that have just formed after fertilization. And what you see is those cells divide and divide and divide. And then they're going to come down and cover the yolk in a process called epiboly. And now they're starting to get the signals to form all the cells of the embryonic body, including the eye, the brain, the muscle, the tail, and all of its organs. 
So zebrafish development is very fast. Um, <coughs> this is particularly appealing to me as a New Yorker because I'm impatient. And so we're able to do a full experiment in um, a week that is at a much faster time scale than could be done with other vertebrate systems. So after that um, amazing rapid development you just saw, the embryo goes on to develop all of its organs. And I told you that since they develop outside the mother, you can watch this happen. And um, since they're transparent, you can manipulate them by putting a um, genetic engineering uh, so that there's a fluorescent protein in the cell that we like, and this is the hepatocyte in the liver. And so we can actually see this little red dot expands over time, and that shows us that the liver is growing during these stages of development. So how does this compare to, um, our, um, to its mammalian or drier cousins? So um, what you see happening in, in 120 hours um, post-fertilization, or about five days in zebrafish, is about equivalent to 19 days of gestation in mice, or um, 260 uh, plus days in um, in humans. And the stages of, the, of liver development, for example, are all just the same. They just happen at a compressed time scale. So a lot of people ask me, why zebrafish? And I want to bring up a little bit of the history of this organism, because I think this serves as a beautiful example of how creativity really promotes great science and how it's um, a collaborative network of scientists that really push a field forward. So zebrafish first started to be used in the 1960s by George Streisinger in Oregon, and he wanted a system where in vertebrates we could study embryonic development. And he came up with this idea in the context of another system that was started in the 1960s by Sidney Brenner, who really wanted to study development and um, came up with this beautiful little worm called C. elegans, where they mapped the fate of every single cell during development. So um, uh, George Streisinger was, um, wanted to have a companion system in vertebrates, and he had a few features he wanted. He wanted something that breeds really easily in the laboratory, um, something that was a diploid, which means that you could easily manipulate its genome, that's fertilized outside so that you could manipulate the gametes and the embryos, um, and that the external development was really important because if you're studying development and you want to see what goes wrong, it's nice to be able to watch those embryos. And finally, Streisinger had a passion for tropical fish, so that took him to the fish store often. Um, and he really started working on this, and this was alongside other scientists who took took this system along with him and said, can we now use this to identify genes that are important for development? So with this um, creative and pioneering approach, <coughs> he launched a field that's now hundreds of investigators all over the world who study development and mutants that have defects in development, who study cancer, oops, sorry, um, um, who study cancer, uh, liver disease, anxiety, sleep, cardiovascular disease, uh, congenital disease, and many other disorders. So this, um, from this beginning in the 1960s, this field has really exploded. So we study the liver, and the liver in, the, in zebrafish looks very similar. Um, if you look under the microscope at the cells, they look very similar. The main cell is the hepatocytes. There are other companion cells that help that liver function. Some of the functions are all of the functions that we've measured in zebrafish match up perfectly with what we see in humans, including um, uh, sugar metabolism and glycogen storage, lipid metabolism, um, xenobiotic or toxin metabolism, and bile secretion. So I'm going to tell you tonight a story or two little stories about our work and some of the discoveries that we have made using zebrafish to study liver cancer and fatty liver disease. So let's start with fatty liver. So um, in America, the main causes of fatty liver are, um, or the main cause of fatty liver is obesity and type 2 diabetes, um, and as well as alcohol abuse. And so our main questions here is how does the fat get there in the first place? And then what does it do once it's there? So I'm really only going to tell you a little bit about this first story. So here's how we do our experiments. We set up the breeding like I told you. We collect those embryos. We grow about 
60 to 100 in a little petri dish, and then we can treat them with any drug or toxin or compound that we want simply by adding it to the water and watching what happens. So in the experiments I'm going to show you, we treat with um, uh, alcohol or toxin, arsenic, and then we can take those embryos and we can put them in a stain that will highlight the lipid. And when we do this, so my lab was the first to demonstrate that zebrafish actually develop fatty liver, and we do this using a straight stain called oil red O. Um, here's the liver, and in the, control, in the controls, you don't see much staining, but when you um, treat them, there's lots and lots of lipid here in the liver. And we have now developed about six different models where we can induce fatty liver in zebrafish. So <clears throat> we wanted to figure out how does the fat get there, and we turned back to the literature and um, looked at the some of the clinical data. So um, what we know from clinical data, as well as um, lots of previous experiments, is that the hepatocyte, this is the cell of the liver, when it accumulates fat or lipid droplets, this is accompanied by some clinical features such as um, uh, defect in protein secretion. In the cells, there's stress and dysfunction, and the hepatocytes don't function as well. So we wondered what was the relationship between these, um, these phenomenon. For example, is the lipid causing the stress, or is the stress causing the lipid? So um, we wanted to see first whether or not we had some of these similar features in our zebrafish models of fatty liver. So we took a look at the endoplasmic reticulum, um, and what you see, this, these nice stacked up um, uh, uh, reticuli here are big and dilated in these um, fatty liver, the fish with fatty liver. And we can look at this using lots of nice imaging tricks, such as putting fluorescent proteins into the fish. Okay, so what does the endoplasmic reticulum do, and what is um, endoplasmic reticulum stress? Well, when proteins are made, they're made in an unstructured fashion, so just as they're synthesized, they're not folded properly, and they need to be folded in order to carry out their cellular functions. And for, for proteins that are destined to be um, end up outside the cell or in the cell membrane, that protein folding happens in the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the proteins that are there and folded move throughout the secretory pathway to the outside of the cell. But you only want to have cell properly folded proteins outside the cell or <clears throat> secreted, so there's a mechanism to prevent unfolded proteins from getting out there. Um, and <clears throat> um, so we have uh, cases where you have unfolded proteins that accumulate in the endoplasmic reticulum, and this is usually caused by a stress. <clears throat> so in the liver, this can be a viral infection, insulin resistance, lipid overload, a toxin, alcohol. Um, these can all lead to unfolded proteins, which trigger a stress response. The stress response then goes... Um, triggers a pathway that alleviates the unfolded protein burden in the ER. And when these unfolded proteins diminish, then the signal's not there anymore, and that unfolded protein response is turned off. <clears throat> there are three major mediators of the unfolded protein response, um, and the one that we focus on is called ATF6. And these function really to... Um, to to turn the signals on to get rid of these unfolded proteins. And so if they're, if they're successful, the cell has adapted to the stress and it, is, it maintains homeostasis, so no disease happens. But if, these un, if the stressor persists, the stress is very high, and the un, UPR simply cannot deal with the unfolded protein burden, it stays elevated, and this can lead to disease. So this is a two-part pathway adaptation and pathology. So we wanted to look at our system to see whether the unfolded protein response was activated in these zebrafish with fatty liver. So what we do is we look at gene expression and we um, take um, fish that are untreated and fish that are treated here. This is alcohol for this example. And what you can see is that this bar is higher than this one. So that means that ATF6 is upregulated in the liver of these fish, whereas we don't see many of the other mediators of this pathway upregulated. <clears throat> we see that upregulation, if we look over time, upregulation up regulation of ATF6 occurs um, in a biphasic fashion. It goes up when it sees the stress, it kind of fixes the stress a little bit, and then it goes back up because the stress persists. We see the same pattern when we treat, oops, sorry, 
um, when we treat fish with arsenic. Sorry about that. So treating fish with arsenic, which also causes fatty liver, also upregulates ATF6. And we've seen this in just about every system where we've studied fatty liver and zebrafish. So we wanted to use genetics to ask the question, is ATF6 required for fatty liver? So we use a genetic trick to get rid of ATF6, add the stressor, lots of different stressors, and then see, do the fish get fatty liver? So when we do this experiment, these are two of the postdocs that worked really hard on this when I was back in New York. What you're looking at here is we just simply treat the fish and we count them. Do you have steatosis, fatty liver? Yes. You get a black um, that goes into the black bin. If you don't, it goes into the white bin. So with no treatment, only about 20% of the fish get steatosis. With treatment, it's over around 75%. And if you block ATF6, it comes back down. So this shows us that ATF6 is required for this response. We see the same thing in, um, <clears throat> that was in response to one classical stressor. We see the same pattern in response to ethanol. Ethanol causes almost 60% of the fish to develop um, fatty liver. And when you knock down ATF6, that number goes down. Okay, so, um, so it looks like from these experiments, ATF6 is required for fatty liver. And so we asked the converse experiment or converse um, question, what if ATF6 is just there all on its own without any stress? Can it cause fatty liver by itself? So um, what uh, Deanna, a postdoc in the lab did is she put ATF6 into the um, liver cells and then measured um, liver fat by our favorite assay of oil red O. And what she sees is indeed over 70% of the fish that have ATF6 in the liver get um, fatty liver, whereas 10% or less um, without ATF6 in the liver get fatty liver. So this is on, the, on its own in the absence of any stress. So... Um, from this, we conclude that um, the UPR functions via ATF6 to turn, uh, to get rid of those unfolded proteins, but there's another response, and that's generating lipid. So what do we know about lipid? Why does ATF6 cause lipid and the UPR cause lipid to be formed? Well, we don't have data for this, but our hypothesis is that one of the things that lipid is, as we all know, is it's a very dense energy source. So lipid provides a great source of ATP, and ATP is required to clear these unfolded proteins. So maybe AT ATF6 is generating the energy that's needed for the adaptive response. However, if you have lipid there for too long or too much of it, it can cause oxidative stress as it's metabolized, and this can lead to disease. So what I've told you about so far is a short story about how we're trying to address fatty liver and how we've made a discovery of a new gene that's both necessary and sufficient for fatty liver. So I'd like to turn my attention to our work on cancer, and I'll focus on just one question in cancer. And that's a broad question in the field of cancer of what starts cancer um, in the first place. So we approach this, um, this question using a very simple hypothesis. So during liver development, the cells of the liver proliferate and they proliferate very quickly. During liver regeneration, the cells of the liver proliferate and they proliferate very quickly. So we thought maybe there are some genes that are involved in these processes and maybe some of those genes get co-opted by the cells as they get transformed to those rapidly proliferating cancer cells. So what I'm going to tell you tonight is a um, story about this gene called UHRF1. And um, UHRF1 is very difficult to say, but it's an abbreviation for ubiquitin PhD domain and ring finger domain containing protein 1. So if you'd like to take that home and try that out for yourself, be my guest. Um, but I'll stick with UHRF1. So um, our first discovery was that UHRF1, when you remove it from the embryos, their liver doesn't form properly. So what you're looking at here is a normal embryo on the top, and that, um, that white dot there is the liver as it expands and grows. And what you can see is that over time in these UHRF1 mutants, that liver does not grow. It stays about the same size. It fails to grow. Some other things also are wrong with the embryo, including the small head and eye. And... Um, uh, embryos that lack this, um, this gene do not survive. So this is a survival curve, and they're all dead by about 10 days. So a lot of our work is trying to understand how UHRF1 functions in development and regeneration. 
And I'm sure my postdocs here who work on that would be more than happy to fill you in on that after this. But I'll focus just here on what we've done with cancer. So the first thing we did is to say, if UHRF1 is going to function in cancer, it should be expressed in cancer. So we collaborated with some great um, uh, liver cancer experts at Mount Sinai, and we looked at a series of liver cancer samples from patients. And what you're looking at here is the um, change in expression of UHRF1 in cancer patients. So if they're above this line here, um, that means that there is an upregulation of the gene. So what you can see is all the dots here fall above that line. And what you're um, looking at along the bottom row is the uh, stages of cancer. So this is an early stage liver cancer, and this is a late stage cancer. And in all of them, they have high levels of UHRF1 expression. Um, the expression of UHRF1 is tied to um, clinical outcomes. So if we segregate the patients to those that have the highest level of expression versus those that have lower level of expression and look at their survival over um, uh, seven year um, trajectory, you can see that high level of UHRF1 expression is associated with a, low, a very low um, two-year survival um, compared to those tumors that have lower UHRF1 expression. So lots of UHRF1 is bad for um, the patient. So is that UHRF1 expression really doing anything? Is it just a marker of bad tumors? So we, this is a major question in cancer, and it's the search for cancer drivers. So is it a passenger or is it a driver in cancer? So the way that we address this using zebrafish is we made a zebrafish that has lots of UHRF1 expressed in its liver cells. Um, we creatively named them low, medium, and high to reflect the level of expression that we have. And what you can see is that um, the ones that express high levels um, uh, have very low survival at um, very early on. So this is 20 to 30 days. Um, and so we wanted to take a look. So Raksha in the lab wanted to take a look and see what was going on there. And what she found, much to our amazement, was that these fish were getting cancer. And um, when we look, when we did the counting, so we as scientists, we love to count. And in zebrafish studies, you can count big numbers. So what you see is that by the time these fish are 15 days old, about 30% um, of them have liver cancer. Five days later, it's up to more like 70%. And so um, with this finding, we were really the first to say that this, is, um, that this gene is an oncogene, which means a cancer-causing gene. And, <clears throat> um, and a lot of the work that we're doing now in the lab is try to, understanding the try to understand the mechanism by which UHRF1 causes cancer. So um, what I've shown you is just sort of a taste of what uh, my lab studies in, um, in the cancer field, but we're also hard at work at studying how um, UHRF1 contributes to development and regeneration. So what I've told you so far is our discovery about a gene that's important for fatty liver disease and one that's important for liver cancer. And so with that, I'd like to um, shift gears and talk about the second part um, of my talk, which is, um, is what I've learned about creativity, curiosity, and the importance of a diverse team and collaborative team in promoting great science. So um, I, I want to um, highlight another one of these um, inspirational quotes, this one from Marie Curie, where she says that a scientist in his or her lab is not a mere technician, that she or he is a child confronting natural phenomenon that impress him or her as though they were fairy tales. So we all know that, um, that um, children have a natural curiosity for understanding the, the world around us, and this curiosity is really what makes a scientist. Um, and so being curious and maintaining that curiosity in our science is really essential. So <clears throat> um, what makes this good science happen? Again, another quote, um, this is um, another one of my favorites from Albert Einstein, who said, um, when people say it's intellect which makes a great scientist, they are wrong. It is character. So what is this character that makes a great scientist? We just saw curiosity is really part of it and maintaining that wonder. But I brought this question to my lab <clears throat> earlier this year 
And we all got together and wrote on post-it notes, which I um, apologize that you can't read them very well, but they're all stuck to my wall in my office if you want to come by and read them yourself. And I, um, what we all did together is to ask the questions of what really makes a great team? What do we aspire to as scientists? And we, came, um, and we did this exercise independently, and then we uh, shared our answers. And what was really amazing is that pretty much everybody came up with the same traits. Um, curiosity and creativity, um, perseverance and collaboration, humility, positivity, enthusiasm, and my personal favorite, zeal. And these all are features that both my team came up with. These are features that I um, value and have seen are important in um, coming up with great ideas in science. But these are also ideas that many other people who study scientists and good science and innovation um, and discovery have also come up with. So having these features of scientists and of our scientific inquiry is really important. But what's also important is that the entire community of scientists maintains these same or practices these same principles because it's through a community of science that we share our findings and then we, um, as a community, challenge findings and discoveries and through that scientific method of revision and coming back to the same question over and over, we come to a consensus. And the consensus that we come to is really how we establish natural laws and scientific facts. And so this is something that I think is really amazing about being science, a scientist because it's a collective effort. However, what happens when the group of people that are coming to this consensus all come to it with the same mindset? So... Um, here at NYU Abu Dhabi and at many other places, scientists mix up between disciplines so that we can challenge each other and come up with different ways of looking at the same problem. But what if the consensus is from everybody that looks the same, thinks the same, was trained the same, and has the same background? We can end up being wrong because we can come to a conclusion that is not supported by different perspectives, but is just one that fits our mindset, and this is called confirmation bias. So um, as we look throughout history to those scientists that have been forming these consensuses, they all have a lot in common. And um, I can, uh, this is the um, hall I walk through every day as a graduate student. This is the main um, uh, medical education building at Harvard Medical School that has busts of all of the famous scientists, many of them Nobel Prize holders, who have been at Harvard Medical School. Um, and um, they all have um, a few things in common. They're all men and they're all white. And the famous scientists that um, have, um, so I did an experiment yesterday. I said, I just Googled famous scientists and looked at their pictures. And so in, in, if I Google it in English, you see a lot of you know, um, familiar faces. Again, most of them male, most of them white. We can do the same exercise in Turkish, in Russian, in Arabic, and in French, although I hand it to the French because there are a few um, diverse faces here, at least. Um, uh, so Marie Curie was um, in France when she did her Nobel Prize winning work. And, um, but regardless to say, across, um, across the, um, the linguistic spectrum, the famous scientists are by and large uh, male. And historically, this could have been in part because of straight out prejudice. So I take again from my alma mater, a faculty member there um, wrote a letter to the dean arguing against admission of women. And he said that he, <clears throat> um, um, he thought that the feminists were apt to overlook that the fundamental biological law, that the primary function of a woman is to bear and raise children, and that the first social duty of a woman is to develop and perpetuate the home. So this um, type of um, very 
conscious bias against women is one of the reasons why women were not admitted to places like Harvard Medical School. Um, although he said this in the background of um, a woman in 1923 who was awarded the first PhD in physiology. Um, and then just after um, this, there was lots of vocal arguments against admitting women to Harvard Medical School. They were admitted in 1945. Um, uh, and on an equal basis with men, and this was largely because most of the male physicians had been lost in the war. So um, while I don't think that um, this type of frank and open bias is the reason why um, women are not now today <clears throat> um, occupying uh, positions of science, it is a curiosity of mine. And um, as a scientist, I really look to promote a diverse team because I want people who will challenge me. I want people who come up with ideas I had never thought of. And I want pe the people in my lab to do that for each other. So if I want a diverse, um, if I want a diverse team, I want to look across the entire population of potential scientists. And as we know, 50% of the world are women, 50% are men. Um, there are some countries that are a little bit um, uh, female biased, some that are a little male biased, but worldwide, it's 50-50. So if 50% of the world is female, um, Let's take a look at the STEM workforce. So this is um, science, technology, engineering, and math. And only 25% of the STEM workforce is female. Why is this? As a scientist, I really don't understand it. And <clears throat> um, I really like to look at data. So some of the data, re uh, not some, but a lot of the data across industries, from law firms to investment banks to engineering firms to science, shows that a diverse team leads to better ideas, smarter innovation, cost savings. And when um, you're looking at revenue, diverse teams always come in with higher earnings. So it stands to reason to me that that would be a good strategy for developing a productive and effective team. Um, but it's just not exactly happening. And why are there so few women in science? There's lots and lots of work on this, and there are a lot of opinions, um, and I'm not going to present all of them, but there are a few. So one is this concept of a leaky pipeline. So the pipeline is thought that get, get girls in in high school and elementary school and middle school, get them study science and engineering, and they'll just rise to um, positions of, um, uh, you know, of leadership. And that just hasn't been the case. So the pipeline has been wide open for a while, um, yet we see, for example, in engineering, 20% of engineering grads in America are uh, women. It goes down to 11% of the engineering workforce. Another reason that people have pointed on is the wage gap. So women across industries earn less than men for doing the same job. In science, it's about 92 cents on the dollar um, for uh, women's income. So maybe women are just discouraged and they don't want to go into this. Um, there's also this concept of stereotype threat, and I don't know if you can read it, so I'll read it for you. So here, there's an undergrad that's saying, that says, uh, wait a minute, I'm the only female in this class, and then she says, okay, no pressure, no pressure, I'll just be myself, um, no pressure at all, and then I'm only here to represent all of womankind, and then freaks out, and the guys around her say, uh, whatever, psycho, and engineering score one, womankind score zero. So this concept of having to represent the whole population of your gender, um, if you're the only one, is something that is a negative incentive for women to going into a field um, or any minority going into a field where they're up underrepresented. And it's complicated. There are lots and lots of reasons. So um, uh, women's confidence is brought up as part of it. Um, lack of qualified incoming talent at the pipeline. Um, I'm not so sure about this confidence when we have the um, idea about stereotype threat. And then there's the issue of work-life balance, which I'll address in a minute. So there's lots of reasons why we don't see lots of women in the workplace um, or in the STEM workforce. But um, there are some, and while we don't understand all of them, we are um, working to, um, to address it. And part of it is through promoting all of these um, features that promote um, great science. So um, being uh, perseverance and showing respect, those make a great science everywhere, a uh, great scientist regardless of gender, but specifically applying them to women really helps to 
um, increase the uh, persistence in science. Um, other tried and true ways are, for example, addressing unconscious bias, um, which I think is a major, um, a major issue, providing mentoring, having role models, um, Interestingly, increasing participation of fathers in childcare um, and creating opportunities for women. Um, and a lot of these are being done here at NYU Abu Dhabi, um, in part through this um, group where I'm very, very honored to participate, this Women Empowered in STEM, um, which, um, which looks to do, sort of address all of these in a very ambitious way. And so one of the um, issues that we think about when they think about one, uh, why women are deterred from entering science is when they say it's like too hard, right? It's really hard to do science. It's very demanding. And there's this thing about work-life balance. So we hear all about work-life balance regardless of industry. And my perspective is that I have never been able to figure this out. Um, so work-life balance means that you have work over here and life over here, and they're in juxtaposition to each other. If one is going up, the other one's going down, and they don't mix. Um, I don't really see it like that. I see that my work and my life are intermingled completely. Sometimes one's up, sometimes one's down. Most of the time, both of them are demanding. And managing them together is really the way that I've seen very successful um, women and men approach um, being uh, productive in science. So <clears throat> I see work and life really intermingled as one, and it's how I um, approach every day, and I've seen lots of women do this very successfully, where we have lots of things that um, are important to us, our families, our science, our marriage, our um, fish facility, our extended family, our community, our lab meetings, and of course our children who, um, who say that they appreciate you, which is really nice thing to come home to at the end of the day. Um, and so having these, um, all of these things together mixed in to one day is um, one way that I think that we can improve the, um, the work life of, um, of women in STEM. And I really have encouraged this in the members of my lab. I um, celebrate their life events with them. And one of the things I'm really the, <clears throat> very proud of in my team is that some of our most um, amazing experiments in developmental biology have happened outside the lab. So when I started the lab, in um, uh, uh, I had, there was one kid that was coming around the lab. And over um, the past 11 years, we've had on average a baby a year in the lab. Um, so there have been 11 babies born to um, members of my lab. And we all enjoy having um, you know, babies around. And we um, celebrate these important milestones in people's lives. And in no time do I ever say that that's your life. Keep it over here. And here's your work. Keep it over here. So... Um, with that, I would like to um, end and to thank all of the people that um, do the hard work in my lab and continue to inspire me and teach me how to do great creative and curious um, science. So thank you.